Greetings, future fossils. This is Michael Garfield welcoming you to another episode of the podcast that explores our place in time. Although, after this week's conversation with Jeremy Johnson, I may have to reconsider my woefully insufficient attempts to spatialize the landscape of experience as a chronotopography. Yes, to my knowledge, I did just make that word up. However, placing the future in front of us and the past behind us, or some variation thereof, is a pretty much universal human activity. Our memories are built upon the geospatial orientation system of neural networks in our hippocampus, and it shouldn't come as any surprise that the instinct to place moments in a calendrical terrain is ubiquitous among those of us living within the complex topologies of human culture. But if mid-20th century philosopher Gene Gebser is to be taken seriously, and he probably should be given the list of people who take him seriously, then the next temporal construct we may be moving into as a human species... Damn it, I did it again! See? I can't even talk about these moments in an evolutionary... What? A sequence? That That isn't right. I mean, basically, I'm totally bound and gagged by my efforts to sequentialize and spatialize what Gebser insisted was an aperspectival consciousness, a world in which we aren't moving from past to present to future, but standing in a kind of all-windows-open cosmic flowering in which all moments co-arise from the ever-present origin of primordial awareness and material stillness, if I'm understanding this correctly at all. Anyway, Jeremy has just written a very fascinating book about Gebser called Seeing Through the World. And that book and this conversation tested me and my ability to imagine into these loftiest mutations of human consciousness and the worlds that they avail to us. But first, I want to give a huge thanks to everyone who has been supporting me and this show on patreon.com slash Michael Garfield, including the new supporters Nathan West, Carl Doby, Nicholas Stanton, Zach Zephyr, and Violet Luxton, who just doubled her pledge, as well as the two people who have purchased my music in the last week, Alex Feldman and Danielle Gaona. I just released my first studio single in years and years, and uh, so it felt appropriate to celebrate those of you who are still buying music, an activity which can scarcely be believed in the age of streaming. Thank you. If you'd like to drink from the fire hose of exclusive content that I post to the Patreon feed, including the new archive of Secret Fossils, the unedited and never-to-be-released B-side recordings that include some extremely cool and interesting conversations that for one reason or another I just do not have time to make available <laughs> publicly. Or if you'd like to participate in the Future Fossils Book Club, which is going to be meeting three times this August and September to discuss Cixin Lu's three-body problem books, the, the Remembrance of Earth's Past trilogy, hop on over to Patreon and help me keep this show independent and ad-free. If you have but your attention to spare and aren't really interested in exclusive access to my Tesseract Creativity Palace, then I hope you'll take a moment and leave a gleaming review of this show on Apple Podcasts. It's like a trace fossil of yourself, only you get to choose what it is, which is more than can be said of all of the other data records <laughs> we are accumulating in ocean-cooled North Atlantic server farms somewhere. <laughs> all right. Okay, I'm done. Thank you for listening and enjoy this spectacular conversation with Jeremy Johnson about Gene Gebser seeing through the world. Jeremy Johnson, welcome on board Future Fossils. 
Thanks for having me. Let it be known that uh, I was just on your podcast and that these are back to back. So, and they no doubt will deeply inform one another. And if you really want, uh, even though we're trying to treating this as two separate artifacts, if you really want the the whole conversation, the whole moment, go listen to Mutations and uh, you will benefit from easily an hour of my own ranting. But I'm going to give this one over to you because you just are such an interesting dude and have so many astute, insightful, studious things to say. Um, so yeah, glad to finally get you on the show. Thanks, Michael. It's It's great to be here. So you just finished a book. Yes. Seeing Through the World. It's about the uh, Jean Gebser, the the uh, sort of, I don't know if you, would you call him the um, patriarch of integral philosophy? How would you, <laughs> how do you, how do you situate this? I mean, he's certainly the, you know, the, the patron saint of a, a lot of these conversations that you and I have about, you know, ecology of mind and, and new ways of experiencing and understanding time. So yeah, let's uh, dig in there a little. Why are you so preoccupied with this guy? And why did you decide to write a book about him? And why do you think the time is, is now for this book? Oh, so many good questions. Um, first of all, the patriarch, um, I don't know if you would like that word, but in some way, you know, he's Okay, we had a we had a Gepser conference a number of years ago uh, that sort of brought in Gepser with Sri Aurobindo and some of these other integral, so called integral thinkers, and we called it Architects of the Integral World. That that sounds a little <laughs> more appropriate for 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 Gepser, but yeah, he was um, you know one of these mid century thinker philosophers who helped to popularize the term integral, right? And uh, he very deeply seem to have influenced Ken Wilber's work. Uh, you know, Wilber borrows the archaic magic, mythic, mental, integral. Those That terminology comes from Gepser. And it also seems to deeply influence William Irwin Thompson, one of our, our mutual uh, 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 mentors. So he's sort of been in the background of a lot of other thinkers, I think, in in this sort of countercultural history of consciousness slash, you know, evolution of consciousness subject. Um, and what makes him very interesting, you know, uh, Thompson speaks to him very, very highly. Um, a lot of his ideas about time and his articulation of, of how these transformations have occurred in terms of what to look for in studying history and studying, you know, um, uh, just sort of the, the the history of the emergence of consciousness. Gebser calls it the the phenomenology of awakening. Are just so detailed, and they just feel, for me anyway. And I, I write this on the on the on the back cover that um, it's as significant as an as C. G. Jung's um, archetypes or the reality of the psyche. There's something about what Gebser called the structures of consciousness that feel very. I don't want to use the f word fundamental exactly, but but they they resonate so strongly that it's kind of hard to to unsee them or unhear them after kind of working through through Gepser's work. So that was sort of the reason why I stuck with Gepser. And the other reason, perhaps, is his prognosis slash diagnosis of the present and, and sort of what's going on with the contemporary crisis and the way he writes about it in the 1940s when he wrote his main book uh, that's been translated now into into English since it was translated in about 85, Ever Present Origin, what he was writing about in the 40s about sort of this crisis of, of Western civilization and, and in between the two world wars and then entering into the Cold War um, and the sort of collapse of modernity that we now know in sort of um, Western philosophy as a sort of post-war turn, right, where we've, we've begun to think critically about this whole idea of progress and technology and, and, and the sort of optimism for for inventing ourselves into the future started to get very, very critiqued. But Gebser has a kind of um, not just a deconstructive impulse. He's, he's really trying to understand these transformations as they pertain to how consciousness is transforming through these different epochs. So um, is this very prescient, I guess is what I'm saying. I like to presume zero knowledge on behalf of the audience, you know, as, 
as though we've, you know, we're, we're entering the dream in media res. And, you know, for, for people who don't understand what you're talking about with structures of consciousness or of, you know, the, the integral uh, structure of consciousness, an integral philosophy, the first chapter of your book is towards an integral philosophy of the present. I'm not going to try and, you know, make you regurgitate that, but I think it's helpful to offer people a little bit of framing so that we can proceed more deeply into the, the, the valuable ideas in this guy's work and, and your elaborations thereon. Yeah, that's, um, that's a good place to start because in that chapter, I try to contextualize it a little bit for the new reader. Um, so Gebser, I, I kind of contextualize him within this, what I call the integral milieu, right? So um, Gebser wasn't the only thinker throwing around this idea of integral. There was also Sri Aurobindo, who was this uh, turn of the century political revolutionary from India. He was um, educated in, in England, and he turned sort of revolutionary turned mystic yogi, right? And he began writing in the uh, around 1912, I think, or 1911 or so, um, more about sort of a synthesis between you know, Western science and then um, uh, Indian cosmology and mysticism. So you have him, and then you also have these other thinkers who were in sort of the early 20th century who were thinking about how consciousness itself has evolved or transformed over time, like Owen Barfield is another guy. Uh, Tehar Deshardin is another guy who popularized this term uh, planetization that William Irwin Thompson then turned uh, into planetary culture. So all of these people in the integral milieu were kind of looking at how culture and consciousness is always kind of going through these 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 um, Gebser calls them mutations. Uh, you know, Ken Wilber has a, kind of more of a stage model of these transformations. Um, Owen Barfield looked at sort of the evolution of specifically the English language and how you know, we related to the world differently, the world, the actual experience of being in the world transforms, you know, and you can sort of trace how that relationship has changed through how we use our language. Um, Gebser kind of has a similar view with that, just sort of how he studies uh, etymology and sort of the evolution of, of etymology. So that that's how I kind of contextualize it, this idea that the nature of human consciousness as this sort of being in the world has gone through these fundamental reworkings, right? And we can study history, we can look at culture, and we can look at the present, especially kind of the art of the present and the sciences to kind of understand these new styles of relating. And that would be like my elevator, you know, explanation, <laughs> like what, who, who the hell was Gebser? What are you writing about? And what is integral? I mean, the integral part is a little difficult to explain in summary, but it's this idea that, you know, we've kind of been exploring these two overall these sort of general impulses towards what the real is you know one is a sor sort of more imaginal participatory psychistic orientation that kind of existed before the rise of empirical sciences and the sort of modernity um the kind of classical world of antiquity that had a kind of a different understanding of what reality was and then we've had this sort of emergence of the new the scientific empirical world, which is very good at measuring things and physical reality and so on, kind of more of a waking kind of mind. And for Gebser, at least, the idea was to sort of bring these two together in this kind of intensification that sort of brings the whole human being into the present and is able to use both, you know, bo both domains. Gary Lockman has a similar framing as well, this whole idea that, you know, using for him, it's sort of the left and the right brain, right? The sort of the uh, imaginal right brain oriented styles of thinking and dreaming and relating and then the sort of waking rational left brain mind i know that's a, like a gross reduction of 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 the actual theory but it's a general mm -hmm. idea of bringing the whole human being together and not necessarily seeing that the scientific orientation towards the world is this sort of dominant superior elevated one right so that's that's sort of the the gist of it Okay, so something that you really make clear in this work that I think is lost if, you know, like myself, people came to Gebser through the work of people like Ken Wilber, who were stubbornly developmental in their articulation of how these different, these different structures of consciousness uh, unfold in both individual uh, development and cultural history is that, you know, Gebser regarded them as, 
as mutations or, or discontinuous uh, with one another, that they sort of form like a quantum leap from this sort of archaic zero dimensional uh, original awareness and, and into its, you know, these elaborations. And I'd love to hear you talk more about, you know, how uh, in, in Gebser's ideas, his writing, his life, his work, he, you know, he was trying to differentiate, not just integrate these different modes of awareness, but to differentiate his premises from this sort of evolutionary or developmental perspective that we often, I think, it feels as though it is like a misappropriation of what he was actually trying to say. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's a big aspect for Gebser. Um, you know, he was, again, he, he had a very interesting life in terms of what he actually lived through. He was born in uh, 1905, and, and he passed away in 1973. So he, at least in his youth, he lived through World War One, and then uh, leading up to World War Two, he he spent a lot of time kind of moving through Europe, uh, avoiding fascists, um, nearly getting shot at the at the border in Spain, uh, nearly barely making it into Switzerland before the border closed with France. Um, so so he was dealing with a lot of well, you know, this a sort of a breakdown of his his home country uh he was born in poland but it was sort of um back then it was it was still a part of prussia so so he was kind of born in this sort of german cultural context and he actually changed his name from hans to jean when he left uh, uh germany uh, formally and officially um so he was very very v- deeply critical of a lot of the mentality that was getting floated around at, at the time which was this whole positivist notion um, he was extremely critical of it, which is why I think he kind of fits in with a lot of sort of post-World War II thinkers that were very critical of modernity as well, but he had a more of a spiritual inclination. Um, and so his, he, he in, in some ways, he's he's very much ahead of his own time in, ter- in terms of the style in which he was thinking about cultural evolution. So rather than seeing it as these sort of sequential, neat, orderly steps into kind of a higher and higher and higher consciousness... Um, he kind of just sort of threw the whole that whole idea out the window and, and was working with this notion that no, actually these transform these transformations are discontinuous, um, and they're sort of fundamental ontological orientations towards the world that are uh, mastered in their own right, right? So the magical is, is sort of understood as a sort of um, one dimensionality, right? Sort of the the world in which. Um, uh, sort of the human being and the natural world are part of this sort of continuous loop that uh, I think you can kind of find that in Deleuze's writing, the sort of the human becoming animal mm-hmm. idea. Um, and that a lot of occult writers talk about too, with this whole concept that, you know, um, a, a ritual is sort of, um, it is the actual act that you're, that you're kind of trying to work, work out, you know, through your will. It, it actually is intimately related to the thing that you're trying to achieve, the actual ritual itself. So there's a sort of interdependency of one thing and all things. Um, the sense of time is more of a kind of a timelessness. And he's sort of gleaning these things, not abstractly, but really trying to feel and sense and relate to works of art. And he was looking at, um, you know, cave art from the Paleolithic and um, the cave art and the material that was available at his time in the 40s. Um, so he he was really trying to to argue that you know the past isn't just some earlier stage somehow it's still present somehow the past is still latent in us and active in us and in the same sense and this is sort of why um, it, it's thematically appropriate being on your show <laughs> is the idea that the future is also somehow present and informing the present and that the past and the future kind of come together and co-inform the emergence and, and the processes of the present. So for him, it's very hard to kind of see this, uh, to distantiate ourselves from, from these older structures of consciousness, because they're not really older exactly. You know, they're, they're still kind of haunting us in a way. Um, and that the modern consciousness, the, the sort of the daylight favoring consciousness of the waking mind, the waking measuring mind that's been sort of triumphed since uh, the Renaissance, but he traces it much more deeply into sort of the history of, of, of um, ancient Greece and so on. Um, 
that is just a kind of a bias of one structure and that there are actually other completely valid other realities that we participate in as human beings, right? So it's very similar actually to McLuhan. You know, McLuhan was very, Marshall McLuhan, a media theorist, and how he talks about sort of preliterate cultures and the sort of sacral preliterate acoustic spaces of, of, of um, you know, uh, uh, human beings who, who before the written word needed to kind of embody their language and their sense of world in themselves and sort of participate in it in a much more direct way. And that language kind of in, in the written form helped to abstract us. He has a kind of a similar process with how he sees the structures unfolding um, in terms of this gradual abstraction from, from uh, direct participation, what he described as the whole. Right. And, and this is a theme we see in a lot of different thinkers, like Richard Tarnas has a similar thing in, in Passion of the Western Mind. Um, you know, Charles Taylor has that idea, right, of the buffering of the self, right, how the, how the modern self has kind of insulated itself from spirits and, and this kind of world that we talk about in terms of animist practices and animist worldviews. So it, there's a sort of gradual abstracting, individuating, um, autonomy-oriented self that emerges in in contemporary consciousness, but that comes at a price. There's always like a gain and a loss in these mutations. Um, so it, he, I think he's just much more balanced than uh, what we see in a lot of thinkers of cultural evolution who tend to go, well, you know, the early human beings had this kind of fantasy projection of spirits and gods, and now we've kind of outgrown that. You know, he doesn't have any of that. He, he's deeply critical of it. So um, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, well, I mean, there's also... You know this notion uh, that that there is that each mutation, even as it insulates us, even as it abstracts us from the you know to use the title of his book, the ever present origin, right? That it is also bringing us closer to an awareness of our abstraction from it, and so you know there's I'd love to hear you speak to. Well, first of all, like the way that involution is handled in his work, you know, and, and not not merely uh, evolution, but a uh, a descent. And then also, you've kind of poked at this just a moment ago, but the sense that sort of historicizing these structures is to impose our own kind of contemporary perspective on them. And so where does that where does that leave us when we move forward into an integral mode where we regard all of them as as coextant or that we understand them with an n plus 1 dimensional sort of understanding of their causal relationships that clearly this is not the story of a linear sequence of things but it's very hard to disabuse ourselves of that. And uh, yeah, so I mean, I'm just, there, it seems as though like there's a way to, in which we can talk about this as, like we were just talking about on, on your podcast in uh, relation to Eric Wargo and his book Time Loops, that in a sense, if you regard the sort of block space time universe in which everything is happening at once, past, present, and future, then yeah, you can talk about like the past causing the present and the future causing the present. But even that is sort of insufficient to what is really going on, you know. And so, it, I, don't, I mean, not being a Gebster scholar myself, it seems as though the, these ideas of evolution and involution are almost like the the Buddhic, uh, the ladder that you, you have to discard, you know, when you've climbed it. You know, the boat that you have to leave on the shore when you finally realize what he's saying about this integral a perspectival consciousness that he believes we're mutating into i mean am i is this even a coherent question there's a few questions right like um well, well okay so let me start actually with that last bit mm -hmm. because um just to kind of add more context for for the listeners on 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 Gebser's life and why he was calling this a perspectival. That was the original term he had before he was even using the word integral to describe this. Um, and, and the idea was, you know, in the 1930s, he was in Spain at the time and um, he was doing work for the Spanish government, I think in the Department of Education or Ministry, whatever they called it. And he 
had this kind of poetic flash of insight. He said it was it was a lightning like flash of insight, and, and it had something to do with everything that we're talking about here. That something about the past, present, and future being kind of whole in the present. It was a kind of a spiritual illumination, and he spent the next 20, 30 years trying to unpack it and eventually writing Ever Present Origin. But before that, he was looking at both the arts and the sciences at his time. So, uh, you know, as we know, anybody who studied kind of art history in, in the 20th century, there was this kind of explosion of this move away from realistic depictions of of uh, time and space and, and, and human beings and art to these kind of more abstract forms. Uh, we had kind of surrealism and Dada and, and all of these different forms of expression that were going on in arts, in the arts. Einstein in 1905 was publishing the, the relativity theory. So there was this kind of break in and breakthrough of these, these new concepts of, of what the world actually is. Um, and so, so Gebser was very curious about that and like what, is this new world that we're kind of emerging into. For him, it began with Rilke and actually the poetry of Rilke. And he was studying sort of the linguistics of that. And, you know, he has some early writings about Rilke in Spain, where he's talking about the aperspectival as a stylism in this kind of new bohemian poetry, right? Where the relationship between the words themselves was a little bit more important than, than the words, that it was kind of this kind of relational diaphanous quality of language that was trying to show something through language, um, something of the invisible. And he began to look more at the sciences as well. So he published a number of books about that. He was always going back and forth between the arts and the sciences. And he knew some of these individuals. He was friends with uh, Lorca when he was in Spain. He met Picasso and some of some French philosophers when he was in France. And then in Switzerland, he hung out with like C.G. Jung and the Uranus lectures. So the, the famous Uranus lectures where Jung did some work and uh, let's see, Henry Corbin, uh, James Hillman eventually. I don't know if Hillman was around at the time though, uh, as Gebser was, but um, he was very kind of, uh, all of this was kind of grokked from these conversations he was having with these individuals about the sort of turning of, of, of a style of thinking and relating to the world. Uh, so he called that the aperspectival. And the idea is, well, perspective is looking at measurable three-dimensional space and measurable three-dimensional time, you know, clock time, chronological time, um, having a point of view in three-dimensional space and looking at the vanishing point and sort of measuring from that. And he was really trying to study that as this kind of underlying phenomenology of modernity, the sort of mastery of space. So underpinning that for the a perspective, a really short summary would be sub, the a perspective was a revolution in understanding time and not time as as we understand it as kind of a measurable spatial time but something that is like what you're hinting at the sort of our language and our concepts and our ladders and our, and our frameworks kind of lose lose sensibility around it um he, he described it as amensional and a perspectival um and the idea behind using a and in, in, even in his language um was to neither kind of um, uh, negate something or really kind of um, um, affirm something. The A is to kind of slip through and, and move beyond the whole oppositional mentality that he saw was so characteristic of um, what he described as the mental structure, the perspectival world of um, subjects and objects, that kind of duality that so many thinkers have written about just in terms of, okay, how do we know things in the West? Well, we have this kind of dualism of thinking of subject and object. He really wanted to get past that. And he saw the different styles of literature, poetry, art, science, you know, with quantum physics and, and even relativity as this kind of movement past that dichotomy and oppositionalism and a kind of a spatial style of thinking and relating to the world. So, I don't know if that answered the question or not, about, but that, at least that's the aperspectival term. And that's what he was, he meant when he was trying to describe that. Um, but I, I guess we could talk about in, involution. Well, too, like, let's, want, I, I want to like, that. let's work on this kernel of time here. Cause I think, you know, most of us in the sense that I understood it when I was, I was thinking and writing about integral time in grad school, like 12 years ago, I, I wrote a piece uh, at JFKU for Sean Hargens, where I was thinking about this in terms of, in in more of a developmental context, you know, how a, an infant, you know, is sort of in this presence, this this ever living moment. And then, you know, we start to correlate things, uh, 
uh, we start, you know, there, there's a, like a, like you mentioned earlier, a sort of uh, s- circular t- time emerges in the magical structure. And then we find a way to like draw that one dimensional object out in a new, a new dimension, a new extension, a, like a tube. Uh, and that becomes the mythic narrative that has like a, you know, a, a, a direction to it, but its own kind of eternal nature or circularity. And then, and then we, you know, we're, we're all sort of by and large, I think like the average human is in this sort of mental structure in which there's a, a linear course to things. You know, there's a, there's an arrow of time, but that's not where he's going with integral time. You know, that, you know, he, he talks about the four dimensionality of it. And again, like, you know, you, you've brought up uh, general relativity and, and space time and the sort of historical coincidence of the emergence of the fourth dimension into human discourse only, you know, a matter of decades before this stuff was coming out. You know, you look at like uh, the time machine and other like late 19th century writing as sort of articulating uh, in in common conversation this this kind of thing for the but it's still we're still like understanding this as though like we're talking about time travelers moving back and forth across timelines and maybe they're branching or whatever but we're still sort Mm -hmm. of stuck in this this mental modern way of thinking it so you know how how do you understand gebser to be describing what it is to have a truly four-dimensional experience of time great question yeah um so gebser was uh in ever present origin and some of his other writing as well he he really tries to detail well the, the the history speaking of time the kind of the history of the emergence of the concept of time and he does this with space as well when he's looking at the emergence of what he calls, you know, perspective out of the unperspectival world or, or the mental kind of emerging out of the mythical world um, as this kind of discontinuous rupture, right? Where where the kind of the mythical membrane of cyclical time and the sort of the the, the seasonal round and the rhythmicity of um, sort of the ancient sciences, you know, the occult sciences in terms of the knowledge systems around cyclical, calendrical systems, and lunar time and the kind of the psychistic orientation of the mythical uh, human being gets sort of broken out of and, and sort of ruptured with this new sense of space, this new kind of cutting visual pyramid of perspective that ruptures that membrane and enters us into this now spatial kind of existential world where, you know, three dimensionality and the spatial self and the individual ego become hyper uh, emphasized, right. As a sort of the history of, in, in the West of modernity. And so he begins to kind of trace that as well with the emergence of time as this concept that first emerges as a sort of a, um, a spatial concept. But he has an interesting way of phrasing it. And it's this idea that um, before time as it actually is, which which he's kind of enigmatic about the way he describes it. And I, and I, and I like it. I feel like there's something true, to, true about it intuitively. And we can kind of get into this too with um, in the previous podcast we were just recording about Eric Wargo and time loops and this sense of the future having some form of reality in the present, that there's something more than just these concepts of time of like moving back and moving forward, like in these kind of linear conceptualizations, these kind of linear trajectories that we have in modernity and in the perspectival world are only an approximation. They're only a kind of a concept of time behind of which we are trying to kind of grasp it. We're trying to figure it out and we're trying to master it with a form of consciousness that just isn't really meant to do that, you know? So he, he talks about this kind of push-pull dynamic in terms of the movement of, of modernity in the last two, three hundred years. And he, he actually pinpoints it with a moment, a kind of a symbolic moment of, of where this kind of got started. And he talks about James Watt and the steam mm. engine and how the emancipation of the machine out of the control of, of uh, you know, its creator. You know, human beings have, have fashioned the machine and have exteriorized it as a kind of idea it's now kind of run away from us. And he's talking about this in the 1940s, of course, you know, where, where 
modernity and progress were being spoken about as you know we were blowing ourselves up with the atom bomb right so so for him he saw the machine as this kind of uh, negative manifestation of what the future was trying to express this kind of time this fourth dimensionality um and that as long as we were attempting to technologize and spatialize and turn time into this kind of spatial metaphor that we can try to control, um, it would always kind of break out and burst out of those systems and run out of control. So anywhere where we see like technology or history, he also says, you know, the emancipation of, of the individual, right? Sort of this kind of out outpacing, speeding up of social revolution, right? This kind of yearning for freedom um, and this kind of push-pull of the kind of nightmare of history that, that a lot of uh, modernists have talked about. There are all these kind of negative manifestations of time, of time as a sort of amensional reality. And he uses the fourth dimension and, and amensional a little interchangeably, which can be confusing. But I think he really means, you know, the fourth dimension as time is more than just the fourth dimension. It's, it's something bigger than our conceptualizing. It's something that's even bigger than that. And that's why, you know, all of our attempts to kind of figure out time uh, end up kind of running <laughs> away from us and causing these crises. And, and you know, we, we, there are these singularities that we can't control. Um, so he, he's seeing that as the same way that he saw the kind of like rupturing of the mythical world, the kind of unperspectival membrane of the mythical world. Same thing's happening now. Technology and everything else is this kind of uh, runaway uh, uh, catastrophe in relation to this older form of consciousness that's, that's sort of ossified and is no longer able to kind of make that discontinuous leap. Um, so the integral is a sort of um, a, a, a mutational leap into time in its quintessence, which seems to be able to express all of these different time forms that have existed throughout history, including linear time, including chronological time, right? Including the magical timelessness and even including the mythical rhythmicity. He's saying like time is actually kind of this multi-formed thing, right? It's this kind of manifold unknowable thing that 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 has all of these capacities within itself um so of course the rational conceptual mind is going to sort of explode trying to figure that out right um so okay that, that that's my answer <laughs> to that question I think. there's a there's a, a a concept in uh skimming your book that i got a little stuck on that i feel is a key to this whole thing and I would love if 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 you would, I'd love to hear you unpack uh, cystasis. Oh man, okay, <laughs> you're asking the good, you're asking the good questions. Um, yeah, so cystasis. A lot of what Gepser is doing in Ever Present Origin and a lot of his writing is he's very meticulous with language, and he's always finding these disclaimers as to why we can't talk about this word or why we can't use that word or how this word is sort of limiting. So we really shouldn't be trying to use it to describe this new style of, of consciousness or new, new style of thinking. Um, he's always trying to find the new concepts. You know, what, what is the new form of statement? Hence the a perspectival. Hence, you know, so cystasis for Gebser is a way to think about orienting ourselves towards the whole, the sort of amensional whole, without creating another perspectival synthesis, another kind of let me map out everything on the spatial grid, and this is all of reality, and everything has its place in this sort of spatial measurement of the world, and this is the totality, this is the whole. For Gebser, that's always, synthesis is, is always a kind of a static form of trying to capture what our friend J.F. Martell always calls mm. the real, right? It, but the real will always break it. So it's almost a kind of a placeholder term for a style of thinking that doesn't do that, 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 that is sort of relating to the whole in a way that's not simply systematizing it and is trying to see it and perceive it and experience it as a dynamic and living process. I think a, a good word, which is another <laughs> another, another um, uh, invented word, but Nora Bateson has that uh, concept called uh, symothesy. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know how to pronounce it exactly, but it's this idea of, of not killing a, a system or picking it apart, a, a dynamic living system in order to understand it, but watching it happen as it's alive, right? Uh, another concept is warm data. So I think it relates to those. There, there's some kind of resonance with those ideas, uh, warm data and, and symothesy, 
um, in her book, um, Small Arcs of Larger Circles. So it's this idea of cystasis is, is um, working and relating to this process of unfolding consciousness and these different structures, these different time forms, different forms of being in the world without completely totalizingly systematizing, um, which is still, you know, what is he saying? This is the style of the mental perspective of the world to syn synthesize, um, to abstract, to spatialize ideas and concepts and, and leave them there um, in a sort of static grid or this static idea. And he says, you know, synthesis is only a kind of a temporary solution because the world is always going to change it up. And we're always going to have to kind of either make our systems our, our systemization more and more and more complex until it's really top heavy um, and collapses, or we're going to have to find a new style of thinking about the world. And so that that's sort of <laughs> a very difficult term to try to understand. I don't even know if cystasis should be carried <laughs> forward, but um, as a word, but that's the word he was trying to use for like, we're not just doing systemization and synthesis. So <laughs> That's my yeah, shot. Yeah, so do it. you do you feel that Gebster actually achieved these uh mental structures or um, do you do you uh I mean obviously there's a sort of like a theological argument where like if you and I are not truly at uh an integral structure like operating from an integral structure uh then we're not going to know. We're not going to recognize somebody who is uh because they include us in a you know a transcendent understanding but like i mean do you do you get the sense that he was you know speaking as as moses looking down on the promised land or or was he aaron you know actually living in it this is a question i i, I heard articulated frequently in the you know the community around ken wilber's work which is like how do we know integral when we're looking at it you know like what are the the symptoms of or like the what's the evidence of this structure of consciousness at work in the world? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think part of that answer is whether or not we acknowledge that our structure, our way of being in the world, the very mental perspectival is, is an actual th thing, you know, is a thing that we're doing. Because, I, you know, the, the precursor to integrality for Gebser is the sense of presence and the sense of, of being able to concretize these other structures and kind of recognize them in our own immediate awareness. You know, if, if we can't relate to the magical and the mythical or even the mental as it is and kind of identify it in us um, beyond an abstract term, beyond a kind of a, a cool concept, um, if we're not capable of getting into contact with it, it's very hard to, to, um, to even consider the integral because the integral then is, it's not just some new layer on, on top of everything, right? The, the idea behind the in integrality is that it's this sort of intensified awareness that's able to kind of see through all of these different forms of being in the world and sort of um, uh, um integrate them as it were right it's, it's the integrator there's an activity that it's doing there's um there, there's a, a living sense of presence and seeing through that that has that orientation so i would say you know just from from reading gepser um yeah i think he there's something about his writing that is very efficacious that i, I talk about it in the book it's, it's, it's sort of a catalytic style of reading that sort of does something to you as you're reading it um it's it's like reading one of the uh, reading a contemplative you know and um th the fact that he always is bringing up interestingly in his writings this idea um his answer for integrality is always to be present to kind of go through these as he's sort of taking you through very meticulously into studying like you know um uh, uh, an ancient mask that doesn't have a mouth or a painting in Chauvet cave or, uh, you know, the, the domed architecture in some, you know, ancient, ancient civilization to sort of really, really, um, articulating it meticulously. He's asking you to kind of be present through the whole thing. And, um, I, I find that sort of injunction to, to be present, uh, a very kind of a contemplative orientation. So at the very least, um, I think he had something going on that was interesting. Um, he describes it as uh, hyper wakefulness, right? Uh, as this sort of capacity to be not only sort of present in a now, but that presence is, can kind of go 
deeper than that, right? It can, can kind of be more intensified than that. Um, and so even though he wasn't a contemplative himself, he seems to be kind of inadvertently making the same kind of statements that you would read in, in, a, in a, a, a contemplative tradition, whether in Christianity or, or in Buddhism. So um, I would say I've lent him credence at least towards that. He seemed to have a kind of contemplative orientation, which I relate to the sense of integrality as as presence. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, it was like we were just discussing on your show that there is there is a, a sense in which as we move from civilization to planetization to, to you know, the borrow the McLuhan language for this, that I don't, I don't we, were, we were talking about, you know, this issue of, of retrieval of earlier forms. And so naturally, if you're going to expand sort of, you use the term spherically in the book, you do talk about the sort of mental structure, building things pyramidally, and then the integral structure embracing things spherically, uh, which to call a shout out to like Darren Aronofsky's the fountain, that's like very, very present in the symbol and archetype of that are like conveyed in that story. And this notion of the emergence of a, a planetary layer that when the planet wakes up through us as itself, uh, it wakes up as a spherical entity, but then an entity that contains all of these pyramids, actually. But at any rate, that that in this process, you know, almost in the way that like when you're using uh, like ever more, this is probably a bastardization, but like when you're using uh, ever more high resolution computer modeling software to render a sphere out of polygons, you know, that the sphere contains the polygons, the polygons contain the the individual vectors that, that constitute their edges that are made out of, you know, points in a vector space. And so you would, I, it makes sense that you would see the synthetic sort of loses sight of its constituent parts. It's like, it's an attempt to trump them sort of, whereas like an integral mode encourages an awareness of, or requires an awareness, you know, it's digging down at the same time that it's digging up again to call on that, sort of the paleontology of the present and that there's not just, you know, to use the sort of abstract mental terminology of the long now foundation is not merely a long now in the extent of a timeline, but there's also a deep now in the sense that all of these, these things exist together within a moment were you to bring sufficient presence to that moment. I am ranting and hoping that you save my ass here. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. Um, yeah, let me, let me just jump in there because, um, yeah, the long now is an interesting idea. And that sort of summarizes, um, well, you know, this sort of coalescing of the very concept of, of history as a sort of linear process that unfolds. We take it so much for granted that I think one of the openings for considering integrality or any of these structures is is really kind of seeing how that concept itself kind of came into being and, and came into sort of our, our awareness, right? The sort of writing down history and the, the long line of kings and the sort of conceptualization of past, present, and future as a line rather than a cycle or a circle. You know, once we kind of get that sense that, oh, we, we used to not really do that or we had these other forms of time that were kind of adjacent to linear time of you know being born and, and growing old and dying uh, adjacent to that was this kind of mythical time right or the the rhythmicity of the seasons and the kind of archetypal play of all that that was a kind of deep and profound reality that can, can kind of um shake us loose from our fixation on linear time but even deep time as you're saying you know, this idea, which is the concept of that you play with in, in the title of future fossils, the idea that, that we are future fossils, or that the stones themselves have fossils in them is, is such a kind of opening of time, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, they're, they're, these things are not very discrete striations in terms of 
okay, the mental time is just, you know, this pejorative that we want to get rid of. No, the mental time can kind of open us up and, and can be rendered diaphanous to this sort of deeper sense if it's taken into relation of the whole. And that's the whole idea, right? We're not just going to go back and retrieve the mythical or the magical. We're not just going to have an archaic revival and dump you know, what we've been doing with the nightmare of history, there's something that's been achieved in this kind of coalescing of the self and the emergence of spatial linear time. That's true as well. So Marshall McLuhan has this idea too, right, where he he's talking about this in the Gutenberg galaxy, where he's riffing on, McLuhan is a very enigmatic figure himself, right? And, and he takes on another enigmatic writer, James Joyce. <laughs> and McLuhan would always say that, oh, James Joyce, what he's doing is what I'm doing. I'm just doing applied Joyceanism <laughs> or, or something to that extent, which is like, what does that even mean? But as he's doing a, a kind of a reading of Finnegan's Wake in uh, Gutenberg Galaxy, he's he's describing uh, Joyce's very poetic way of sort of describing these different forms of media, right? This different communication forms. But by doing so, he's sort of, uh, McLuhan is at least interpreting Joyce He's taking us on this kind of tour de force of all of these different forms of communication and media and relating to the world um, from the sacral preliterate human being to the to the scribal to the to the print to the now the the kind of um, modern human being right of of, of um, who's kind of like a an amalgamation of different things and he's trying to putting himself together as a pastiche right a very kind of postmodern idea um, but but McLuhan is saying that like for somehow electronic culture or like the kind of the spirit of the age, right, is is the sense that we are retrieving the past. But as he says, you know, let's make it awake as in, you know, like a, a wake up with a funeral or awake, right? And that the human being is actually this kaleidoscope of different ways to relate to time and space. You know, we, we are this kaleidoscope of the structures. And to be present with it all, to be awake with it all is what we're doing. We're not just kind of regressing into the magical or the mythical. There is no sense of regression here. It's all kind of bringing it into this intensified present. And so that to me is a sense of what Gebser's talking about with the sphere and what, you know, what we're talking about with this planetary. It's this idea that we have to bring things into this intensified present. And that's the kind of the diaphany. That's the kind of the seeing through of these different forms of time to have a sense of time as being ever present means that yeah the fossils are going to start speaking to you you're going to be you know, time is opened up in that linear sense but it also means time is opening up not even just in the linear sense but the different forms of time so that's sort of like you know we're kind of getting into the sort of the mystical zone <laughs> talking about all this so what does the the hyper wakeful kaleidoscopic human being look like of the future um but then again you know maybe that's what we need to be uh, uh, imagining and, and trying to to relate to, and that that's sort of the the integral invitation mm. as well, right? To be present with this kaleidoscopic human who is past, present, and future, who is both the archaic and the contemporary and the future being, and letting that kind of co-inform how to survive through this crisis, right? Um, that somehow this has been the the kind of I don't want to call it the point, but in a way, we're going back to the point. We're bringing everything back into this conscious present and retrieving it very consciously. And so, you know, McLuhan talks about this. Gebser, this is really the heart of what Gebser was talking about, bringing all the structures into the present to to not destroy ourselves because he saw what we were doing in the 20th century as a sort of immoderate, one-sided overemphasis of this, the sort of waking, measuring spatial mind that didn't understand time, that didn't understand complexity, and sort of the unforeseen consequences, right? Um, that only kind of saw the world as this sort of measurable thing that could be assimilated and kind of um, used to its own advantage, like Heidegger talks about, right? With the whole, um, uh, in his essay, on a question concerning technology, the kind of challenging forth of nature and standing reserve. That's sort of where the perspectival mental world ends up when it's sort of cut off from the other structures and when it's immoderately imbalanced. So the whole idea of kind of bringing it into the whole is this sort of, this new structure is this new form of intensity that is trying to check that, mm. you know? So, you know, because so. I am fucked up in this way, <laughs> I feel like I have to grasp at this in, you know, like there is room in this somewhere and where is it? to make sense of this 
movement into the a perspectival, into the a in into an awareness that transcends these sort of elementary or rudimentary causal understandings as itself a an adaptive response to reality to to the real that this is a this is an evolutionary adaptation to a world in which the mental structure is no longer sufficient in some sense that there is a way to narrativize it in this way and you talk about this in your book and the subheading under integral singularities where you're talking about the discontinuity between these these structures of consciousness as spaced by catastrophe and elsewhere in the book you you reference um you know Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge the paleontologists and their notion of punctuated equilibrium you know that there is this sense that things find a, a sort of a holding pattern and then things change and then it calls forth you know a, a new a new world age you know the uh sort of trite example is you know the meteor at the end of the age of dinosaurs i mean but that's still that's still in in many respects insufficient because people who are really studying that particular discontinuity in earth's history will note that the pattern of extinction at the end of the cretaceous is not easily explained purely by the sort of single linear cause of the meteor hitting the planet it's complex <laughs> let's say that there's what you know what other scholars have called the press pulse theory that there are um nodes that the the meteor was implicated in you know a kind of extinction conspiracy of like volcanic eruptions and continental drift and all this other stuff but you know even so that's still sort of a linear telling of it uh, or a narrative telling but i'm just curious like if you're to sit and think about this coming back to the the first question i asked the why of this like why now uh, <laughs> if it's like what is it about the 20th and the 21st century that provides a suitable ecosystem within which this you know integral structure precipitates or what is it that whether you regard it as an evolutionary incentive or an involutionary opening what do you think it is about this time this now as opposed to like the now of a thousand years ago in the the mental telling that is distinct, that is availing itself to the emergence or eruption of this structure? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so uh, Gebster has this, this, this phrase that he uses every so often where he's describing why do these particular structures sort of coalesce in history? You know, uh, on, the, on the one hand, the structures he's describing are sort of adjacent to history. They're kind of dimensionalities of being, of the real that kind of come forth and materialize uniquely in a particular culture, in a particular time, um, as we would understand in historical time, using that framework, which we can't really avoid, being very mental beings. Why? You know, what is the particularity of, well, the integral structure emerging now or any of the structures emerging as they did? Um, and he's not very clear about, you know, what it is exactly, but he does kind of play around with this idea that there's some kind of morphology to the whole process, right? That moving from zero to one to two to three to four dimensional, um, there is a kind of unfolding that is kind of occurring through a process, but what is exactly happening, right? And, and so for him, he kind of borrows a little bit from Sri Aurobindo talking about the concept of involution here. And he's kind of describes that, well, the integral is a structure that is sort of coming into being because the real or reality, the whole is more integral. And we're never going to kind of, you know, the way the process is unfolding is that, you know, consciousness wants to kind of actualize its nature. So, you know, we're never just going to only actualize the mythical or the magical or even the mental that there's some kind of difficult to describe morphology and unfolding that's taking place that's sort of crystallizing and realizing what he calls very enigmatically the itself. And he says adjacent to history is this core, the itself, he uses like a capital I in, in one place, a very kind of weird mystical term, um, that kind of awareness behind awareness. And, and we've been participating in its unfolding as it's been participating in our 
coming to consciousness. You know, we, we, we've been able to bear this. He describes it as a kind of um, a joy and a burden to be in time, to be in this unfolding and to deal with everything, you know, life has dealt with. And I think Aurobindo has more of a kind of evolutionary view of this, right? So like he has the sense that, you know, it's not, Gepser's only looking at sort of the structures and, and relating to human beings, but Aurobindo is kind of looking at the whole unfolding of biology and life itself, right? The whole cosmos itself is kind of waking up to what it is, you know? So I, I think there's something in there about the phenomenology of awakening, not just being about human beings, but about what nature actually, what, what the real is, you know? And, and why now? Well, um, I, this is where we are at this moment in this sort of unfolding and, and intensification. Um, there's something about the present that it's come to a head. You know, we, we've got to somehow concretize the whole at this point, you know, at this po- in this part of the story. I, of I, I got to say, right? I, I just, I, I feel like I just had a flash where I realized, uh, I feel like I got in there a little bit into the integral mode and it loops us through like a Mobius band back into our conversation on your show, where we were talking about the past and the future meeting in the present as a, a kind of a a mutually causal handshake and that why now is like the wrong question in precisely the same way that asking, you know, a question like Fermi's paradox, like, or the question that the anthropic principle tries to answer, like, why is it, why here, why us is the same question as why now? And it's, and it's, it's actually pointed backwards that it's not that, this moment prov- necessarily provides the conditions for this thing to occur, but that this thing occurs and that we therefore locate it here. You know, that, that, yeah. that it's um, because it occurs, then for those of us inclined to, you know, episodic narrative and viewing things through the lens of cause and effect, then we're going to slice through the you know the hyperdimensional reality of this thing in such a way that it appears as though there is some sort of reason for it happening now but that like alan watts talks mm-hmm. about you know the, there is no meaning of life meaning refers to life that why now is it's actually sort of like because is sort of the, the like the insufficient but only available answer at the level that the question is asked <laughs> it's like i love that and uh, yeah no that's 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 great um are, are you familiar at all with uh, with this kind of question i think we have to relate back to like myth and and narrative and story but are you familiar at all with um grant morrison's the oh Invisibles? man yeah you know i didn't read the whole thing i read like the first book of it and i read some of your really excellent writing on it i'm not by any means capable of quoting scripture <laughs> There's, I, I'm not exactly great at that either, but there's a, a line that I have always remembered and it's, and it's part of one of the characters sort of initiation story where they're in this kind of visionary state and Morrison himself is sort of playing around with these different forms, these different parts of this person's life that are kind of collapsing in this sort of initiatic visionary state like them in childhood, them kind of going through a traumatic experience and then them in, in the sort of present of the story. And they're all kind of asking the beings in this in this sort of state, well, how is this happening? Why am I in the past? And, and the being is like, you should know by now that things are ever present. There is no past, present, or future not apart from each other. Things are ever present. And I just got a kick out of that because, you know, I don't know if, if Morrison has ever read uh, Gepser's work but um, I, I enjoyed the ever present being in there. But it, you know, it's, it's that kind of answer. And, and Morrison has, you know, himself this visionary kind of psychedelic experience that he writes about, where he kind of gets—I don't even know how to explain it. But it's that um, whole weird experience at Kathmandu, right, where he's sort of pulled out of time, and he sees time as a sort of—he sees the Earth as a sort of organism that's sort of in a kind of embryogenesis state, right, and the whole thing is sort of growing this being in time. When I hear stuff like that, I mean, I like those statements because, you know, I, I don't want to take them as scripture, as we were just saying, but I think as a kind of planetary mythology, this whole idea that something is being grown through time, you know, consciousness and incarnation and the human being and the sort of unfolding of not only our linear history, but these structures are all part of this sort of emergent 
waking up of this sort of uh, I don't know, <laughs> sleeping God that Orbendo calls, you know, the words, words kind of escape what it means. But I like those kinds of myths because I think they kind of get at it a little bit. They get, they give you those aha moments for what this kind of amensionality could mean and, and how to respond to you if things are amensional. And if we're starting to think in that style then it wouldn't make as much sense to, to say, you know, why now, like you were saying, or like, why here at the Fermi, Fermi paradox? Mm. Yeah. So <laughs> I want to zoom out a little bit here from like our, our like teasing the boundaries of knowledge and, you know, getting into the, the, the grainy details of Gebser's work to, you know, your place in you know, this global conversation around his work and the scholarship that seeks to, you know, expand upon, explore, elaborate the legacy of this brilliant thinker. So where is that now? I mean, there's a, there's a Gebster society. Uh, are you still at the helm of that? Or where is the conversation in the wider sense? And where is it? Where do you think it's, it's going right now? Culturally, where, where do you see this um, taking root? Where are we present in this conversation in the sort of wider sense of things? Yeah, great question. Um, so this is sort of the subject of the next book slash books that, that I am working towards, which, you know, for the past couple of years, really, I've been trying to think about how these ideas and concepts and as a methodology, getting like very specific, like how does... Gebser's approach, thinking about cultural phenomenology in terms of these structures and sort of looking for how they all relate to one another in the present through particular cultural expression, how that's playing out, you know, since 1949 and 1951 and 52, when, when this book was written. In many ways, you know, the macro picture is sort of more of the same exacerbations of this sort of perspectival world, right? Like, Gebser was talking about, you know, the, the sort of the end game of perspectivalism in the mental world, which is that cutting pyramid, right, that visual pyramid that makes the cut as sort of eventually breaking down to the point where everybody has their own little perspectival reality tunnel, right, where every nobody's able to talk to one another and everybody's in this sort of sense of cultural warfare and fragmentation, right, and social isolation. Um, and and I, I find this is continuing to be a conversation that we're having today with the allegedly very connective technologies of things like Facebook and, and social media. So this whole phenomenon of the culture war is very interesting phenomenon to kind of read through into what's going on with our this cultural phenomenology of perspectivalism that's still at play. But, you know, Gebser was a nuanced thinker, so he has this idea that and uh, you know Thompson has the same concept, right? That that there's this kind of interplay of dark and light, of, of chaos mm. and signal, and noise and signal. Um, so he, Gebser describes it as sort of this Janus phase period where there's there's new this new aperspectival style of thinking and relating to the world is trying to come online, in a way. But we're still kind of entangled with the mental and the perspectival. So we're kind of we have these weird hybrids where, you know, the internet is this sort of image of the world collecting as a global brain or as like the Tehardian new sphere. But then we're still doing things that are deeply, deeply kind of perspectival and mental, like this sort of, you know, designing our algorithms and applications like um the same the same algorithms that work for casinos, right? And, and for like gambling addiction are the same things that we use for Facebook and 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 Snapchat. So there's a kind of an instrumentalism that's still encoded in our architectural impulses to design spaces and design uh, social spaces that's still very perspectival. And Douglas Rushkoff talks about this. I mean, he's essentially talking about that same relationship in his latest book. Uh, Which Team I got to interrupt right? and just say, we were talking so much about Tim Morton on, on your show. And I think, wow. you know, Tim Morton just put, put out an interview or was, was interviewed um, in which he made a point that I think is a direct critique of, of Doug Rushkoff's team human thing, which is that Marxism ignores the non-human, you know, that real communism would include uh, non-human intelligences. It would, it would be in that sense, you know, a perspectival in the sense that it's wrestled itself free from a fixation on the merely human in which communism is still sort of beholden to this, this capitalist, effort to externalize 
everything else, you know, I, and so I, I, in a weird way, even though I love what Doug is doing with team human, it does feel like it's carrying forward a, a sort of very dangerous limitation. I, I get what you're saying. Um, you know, I have mixed feelings about that too. I've, I've had conversations just sort of about this whole notion of human, how does that fit into what he's talking about? Because in many ways, um, Rushkoff is talking about sort of retrieving a kind of medieval renaissance, right? He's trying to reverse this concept of renaissance to be more about what the pre-modern social spaces were doing and what they valued. And he's saying, okay, this is, they kind of had these more soul oriented things and human oriented principles, but you know, that there, there's some, there's some ambiguity there, right? Because the perspectival world is really the most anthropocentric we can possibly get, right? Which is this whole notion of like, what is real and, and what is totalizing is what, you know, man can measure. Man is the measurer of all things in this sort of, this sort of Renaissance humanist perspective. So there's an ambiguity in there that I, I get exactly what you're talking about. And in many ways, the sort of the pre-Renaissance period was more interested in the sort of a cosmic participation, like how the human being, the little person, right, worked in the sense of the whole, this kind of cosmic drama. Probably have to go back and turn it, turn the dial back a little bit in chronological time to um, uh, earlier periods, looking at more kind of, I don't know, polytheist and animist uh, cosmologies to kind of get that better. But um, but yeah, I get what you're saying. But Morton too is, is an interesting figure who I write about in the book a little bit as sort of this aperspectival styled thinker. Um, diaphany and transparency, right? It's this idea that the human world no longer becomes a sort of totalizing, ossified boundary between the self and nature, right? Between the human being and the other, that boundary starts to dissolve. So everything Morton is talking about, just in terms of the whole feel and style of his philosophy of hyper objects, mm -hmm. right? And uh, getting kind of out and beyond humankind and human centric views. And even the Anthropocene is this idea that the human being has sort of collided with nature and natural forces. So it, it's kind of um, counterintuitive even to call it the Anthropocene, right? Because we have become other, right? There's this sort of Mobius strip of human beings and nature that's sort of exploding and imploding at the same time in, in climate change and sort of this sort of ecological catastrophe. So the whole world that the Renaissance has built up that we were talking about before of this sort of perspectival world is is that's the bubble that's bursting. So we really are we really need kind of a an other uh, a team. I don't know, non-human, right? I don't know. There's what uh, um, what's his name talks about this too. Uh, Eugene Thacker mm. when he's talking about the 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 philosophy of horror in uh, in the dust of this planet, where he's talking about the limits of this sort of anthropocentric philosophical reasoning and the and the scariness of the limits of reason, right? The horror of the world as it is, the planetary, he calls it, interestingly. There's a kind of a, a void and a horror and a via negativa to that. But to me, like all of these things are kind of stylistically describing the a perspectival. You know, it's the world that's sort of opening us up um, beyond beyond the perspectival man is the measurer. And so anything that's doing that is sort of, it, it's, for me, it's hopeful, right? That we're starting to think in that way, that we're, that we're having in the humanities, they call it the non-human turn or the more than human or the other than human turn. There's a lot of negotiation about what to call it exactly. And, and object-oriented ontology is another, you know, what Morton's doing, uh, Graham Harmon and all those guys sort of making objects bigger on the or discovering objects as being bigger on the inside than they are on the outside, that's a kind of um, an undoing of this perspectivalism that would see an object as this kind of finite, measurable thing. So anywhere, we're seeing this kind of style of thinking beginning to emerge everywhere, I feel, um, in the middle of this big crisis that we're having. So um, I, I'm kind of hopeful about just in terms of what Gebser was talking about is, is kind of happening everywhere. So it, it kind of lends credence not only to his thes thesis about a perspectivalism, but also, you know, his his whole concept of the future being latent somehow, you know, he, he kind of embodied that in his writing by being able to intuit a lot of things that are going on today. Um, but in terms of very, very specific question about the Gebser yeah. Society, yes, that's still going on. I'm still president for now. Um, we're a small society. So, you know, it's just sort of whoever takes up the mantle um, kind of gets stuck <laughs> with it for a little while. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, that's fine. We, we're doing a conference on Carl Jung uh, and Gebser, sort of a comparative study 
in October of this year, and I can give you the link to that. And the last one we did was at Naropa of last October. And that was really, really great. We did uh, kind of a Gepser in light of Buddhism and contemplative traditions. And, and that kind of got into that subject we were touching on earlier about, you know, how exactly does all of this stuff, which sounds very contemplative and mystical about presence and lucidity and diaphany and how does that all relate to the contemplative traditions? And there is a lot of connection. So um, yeah, we still do work. I would say that's kind of where the very active Gibsarian scholarship is, but I'm hoping to kind of carry it forward into, into kind of um, this more of an academic discussion with, with other thinkers and theorists and, and kind of relate it back out to the discussions like we're talking about right now with Morton and these other guys who are talking about interesting things um, in the sort of larger... <laughs> intellectual well, discourse. hopefully this conversation with this uh armchair pseudo intellectual you can you can bootstrap into some <laughs> some more legitimate philosophical uh not discourse right because that sort of suggests again like a hegelian dialectic but something that carries us deeper into the mystery of being dude jeremy I, um, my head is spinning, which I have to admit rarely happens on this show for that. I am deeply grateful. And I, I really, uh, I'm glad that you're, you're out there carrying the torch for all of this stuff, everything that you're doing with the mutations podcast and, and Revelor press and neuro learning, which we didn't even get to all of the cool ways that you are, uh, creating space for, for conversations like this in your life and work. Uh, I, I commend you, sir. So um, where would you send people to go deeper? Well, uh, first of all, thank you, Michael. This has been really fun riffing with you. Um, and I, I love listening to your show. So people could find me on uh, my homepage, which is just jeremydanieljohnson.com. And uh, I have a little Patreon and that's connected to mutations. So you get to hear some of the podcasts early or some of my writing early. So definitely check that out. We also do a book club. Um, it's not like a deep, 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 very hard to read book club. So don't worry. Um, we usually read science fiction, like we're reading Vallis right now, uh, Philip K. Dick's Vallis. Yeah, that's not deep. Um, <laughs> and no, no, no. Well, you know, it's, I try to keep it succinct with the book club, you know, it's something we can read in a month together. So yeah, so that's the best, those are the best places. And then neurolearning.com, of course, is where I'm hosting a lot of courses with many interesting people, some people who've been on your show, like Becca Tarnas. So yeah, just find me there, find me in those places or connect with me on Twitter. I'm always happy to, to riff with anybody who'd like to uh, talk more awesome. about these things. And uh, thank you, Michael. It's been a that, real pleasure. Yeah, thanks for today. having been, being, and being about to be on the show. <laughs> there we go damn you language future fossils is part of the mind pod network a truly excellent cornucopia of mind expanding podcasts and is brought to you in part by our featured patreon supporter mike schwab who works at knowyourmeme.com and has donated his weekly call out to know your meme which is a truly cool site if you're not familiar with it it's an exercise at scale in what wjt mitchell would call a paleontology of the present a wiki based effort to pre-digest the ridiculous abundance of memes and internet culture for those future unborn historians this show attends to so frequently that's just a fancy pants way of saying it is an extremely cool site about memes you should go check it out if you would like to support future fossils go to patreon.com slash michael garfield or just leave this show a review on your podcasting platform of preference it's hugely helpful and i greatly appreciate it Thanks again for listening, and I'll have the next episode up in the geological blink of an eye.